The views, opinions and research conclusions expressed on this show are those of the show host and not necessarily those of the network Access Northwest Community Radio or any of its associates. The author and host is solely responsible for its content. The author has made every endeavour to be historically accurate and factually correct based on the written audio and video claims of the person in question. The playing of this show does not constitute as an endorsement by Access Northwest Radio. Hello and welcome to Paranormal Mysteries here on Access Northwest here in lovely Liverpool. Tonight I'm talking to Philip Kinsella, who is an author, a medium, a radio show host and an experiencer. I recently heard him talk at the Outer Limits conference this summer. I found his talk particularly interesting due to the fact that he was talking about his experiences with the Greys. I could go on, but to be honest, I'd rather just get straight into the conversation. So, hi Phil, welcome to my slice of life. Hello, Sasha, and an honour to be on board. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honour to have you on. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I've loved meeting you and Ron. You are absolutely fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> In many, many ways, I've really enjoyed your company. So I've been looking forward to speaking to you because... We've got some things in common, and um, you're trying to kind of find an overall picture of what might be going on with the greys, as uh, most of us experiences, but you've, you've actually put some stuff together, so I thought it would be interesting to go over that for my listeners, because they like that kind of thing, so... Yeah. Mm. so I mean, one of the things is, Sasha, that, you know, when someone does have and what is called an abduction at the, the point that it happens you know with myself back in the winter of 1989 i didn't understand what actually had happened um it's only when you start to realize that the experience seemed to change you in some way and leave you with physical marks and when the system that we serve tells you that there are no such things as ufos and there are no such things as aliens and that, you know, the, the, the taboo subject on life after death. Well, it's blatantly clear to the individual who's gone through the experience that either you're lying or the system's lying. And I discovered that actually it's not you as the individual who's lying, that we are being lied to, that there is a, a consensus to conceal this information from the general public. And uh, I like the way Sashi brought into the greys because... That is what I experienced, so I can't talk for other areas of the UFO phenomena like other life forms that certain people have experienced. But the greys seem to be the main area of interest and certainly very famous within the field of UFOlogical research. So that's where I got interested with regards to the greys. The experience itself that I had back in 1989 was very, very bizarre. Um, I'd come back from work, and at that time, we'd lived in a small village in the, of Marston Mortain, which is some miles outside of Bedfordshire, and, and in order to get to work, I used to have to get the train from Millbrook to Bedford. And on this particular night that I'd come back, it was uh, winter, so it would have been dark, um, I'd made my way home, and the only people in the house was my brother and my sister and our dog, Benji, and we, we lived on a corner in a cul-de-sac, so it's quite a big house. So I, I walked up to the drive, went inside, you know, say hello, walked through the hall and then into the kitchen. And we we're just having a drink and talking about the normal stuff that people normally talk about. And all of a sudden, where I'm stood within the kitchen stroke diner, the, the dining room door is opened, which leads out to the hall. And we had frosted glass windows that lead out to the to the driveway. And I, I suddenly felt this strange atmosphere. It was almost as if it was an electrical current that started running around the room. And my brother went into some type of strange trance, and, and he was at the corner, so he didn't have uh, the, the central observations where I was. So, but he went into this trance, and he lifted his head up and said, there's going to be an earthquake or Grandma's going to die. And at that point, it was so quick, this light came up from what I thought was a car light from out the front through the frosted glass windows, and the light started to increase in intensity through the glass doors of the house. And then I could see the glass door starting to bend, like, like, it's weird. It was like bending, like something was trying to come through. 
at this point the dog was really barking and yelping and and I at that moment I didn't know how to react to this very strange experience and then it became even more bizarre when I saw this small figure that was about three foot tall clad all in black with what I thought was a black motorcycle helmet on its head very thin body and it came through the glass door like it had just popped through and ran through to the bottom of what was then my brother's and mine study stroke bedroom it was a big room downstairs huge room and at that point I froze I you know when you're met with something that challenges the normal processing of everyday life and you're met with something so bizarre it's like well what, what's just happened mm -hmm. but anyway I I the dog's going mad, crazy, really mad. And then I see this thing come from the corner of the room in the hall and I ran across up the stairs. And at that point, I freaked out. I took a knife from the drawer behind me and I shouted, there's an intruder in the house. And I shouted again, there's an intruder in the house. And when we had made um, you know, a search of the house upstairs, all the rooms, there was nothing. And I remembered that night I broke down because... I couldn't understand what it meant. And then uh, initially, I thought that was it until the early hours of the morning and something that was even more bizarre that occurred that I had, that I paid the price for, unfortunately, when the media machine got involved with, with the fi finer aspects of what we call an abduction. So we couldn't find any evidence of this thing. My brother had come out of his trance he doesn't understand why he said what he said, because our maternal grandmother was still alive at that point, and there was, certainly was no earthquake. My sister had been in the far corner of the room, but had witnessed an, everything that had occurred, bar from seeing the, the being. I, had, I was the only one, and the dog, I'm sorry to say the dog, <laughs> but he once that saw the, the being come through the door and then run up through the hall up the stairs to up to the, up of the house. So in the early hours of the morning, I then found myself, because um, our room was downstairs, floating on my back, and I woke up on my back, and I was probably about three foot off the, the, the floor, and I was coming through the hall. It was all dark, and I remembered thinking, well, this is weird because I can't move, and something's moving me. Uh, my head was facing the, going towards the hall, so as I went through the closed glass doors to the kitchen because it's all glass um, I kept thinking well how am I able to get through solid matter how is this possible and so I went through I was being pulled through the kitchen through to the conservatory doors through to the conservatory and out to the garden and we had a very big garden with a pond and as I was being taken outside I remembered being circled upright so I was now looking up at the sky uh, that was pitch black and there were UFOs flying across the sky and I'm thinking in this state UFOs are real they're real they actually exist and as all these crafts were flying through the sky there was one main one that seemed stationary and caught my attention and no sooner had I focused upon the the spherical silver object why well, pulled up so it felt like you know when you're on a roller coaster and you get that feeling you should take in the dip down mm. Um, it felt like I was going up and I was getting moving much faster towards it and then I blacked out. The next part is the most horrific part and this is where this is what led me into a lifelong study and investigation of the facts and the fantasy and all the rubbish of ufology. I wanted to find out what the abduction phenomenon meant and what the, these entities were. Shall I explain what happened? Yes please. I awoke disorientated and I found myself in a room that was very hot and, and slightly very dull. I, I couldn't I couldn't see a great deal of what was what was in the room because I found myself strapped to a bed and the the sudden shock and realization of finding myself strapped naked to this bed horrified me because it was like you know when you're in one of those um, dreams and you wake up and then you, 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 you can't work out what's happened around you. Like when you wake up sometimes and you think, what day of the week is it? What day of the week is it? Yeah. I woke up on this bed and I'm strapped to it and it's hot. It's very, very hot. It's like a 
sauna. And I then realize that they that something has been put in the lower part of my anatomy and the the actual object itself I could feel within my stomach. So I realized there was something inside me, but seemed to be pulsating within my stomach. And at this point, I freaked. I was like, I, I couldn't move. And I was hot. And I remembered lifting my head up to see what was going on. And when I turned to my right, um, there were, I paid the price for this, there were three reptilians. And um, they were very tall. They didn't communicate. They were moving backwards and forwards in this very strange ritualistic trance movement, but they were covered in fog. There was a lot of steam everywhere, and I started to scream and ask them to remove this thing out of me. I want them to get this out of me. I was petrified. I can't express the fear that I had gone through, and it's a nightmare that I will always remember for as long as I live, even all the way back in 1989. And they, it was like I was a piece of meat. I didn't matter to them. I was nothing to them. But this thing inside me, I wanted out. And then there was this grey, but it was more of a cream-coloured grey that I came... Yeah. And it came forward, and I can't remember, you know, what was going on at that point because I was so horrified. I wanted it out, but he came forward, and I assumed it was a he, and the straps were released and this mechanism had gone off, the, come out and gone across the floor. And I was ordered to sit, I was ordered to dress, and I was ordered to follow it. But you know what? I felt kind of like a little bit empathic because I felt that this smaller being, people call the grey, had released me from this nightmare. Right. And when he asked me to follow him, I remembered walking through this to, to this room that had no windows, there were no doors, there were these very dull lights that was coming through the, the steam of the room. And then he came to this wall, and the wall opened. And we're getting to the last part of this very strange <laughs> experience. Um, the wall opened, and I could see the village now. It, the, wherever we were was above the house. And when I looked out, there was another craft that was hanging very low to our conservatory. And I could just make out the forming of another being. Yeah. The grey took me to a wall, and the wall opened up. And when I looked out, I could see that we that we were at a height, and we were above our house. And that when I looked to the corner, I could see there was another cylindrical craft hanging very low by our conservatory um, conservatory building. And underneath was another smaller being. I couldn't make out much from from that. But the being was saying, "Right, get out." And I'm like. You want me to get out? I have a fear about heights. You want me to leave? I started to get upset. And the next thing I knew was that they it wasn't a push, but it was like I was shoved out. And I was amazed that I could float down to through the air and to the garden. And there were two greys beside me. They told me I wasn't to look at them. And as I came down to the ground, I was. this is the, the last part to this very bizarre experience there was another grey standing in front of me. And these other two bugs had cleared off. I don't know what happened to them. They just went. Mm. But this other grey seemed a little bit more human. Its face was pear-shaped. It had slightly smaller eyes than the big almond-shaped eyes the greys have. But it wore this pointed hat on its head. And it wore a one-piece uniform with, with knee-length boots. And it had its arms folded across its chest. And it was looking at me really angry. And I thought, well, who the hell are you? I mean, I've just come from up there and, you know, he was looking at me so angry and so nasty. I could feel it within my solar plexus or my stomach. I felt like I wanted to go to the loo. I know it sounds embarrassing, but he scared me that much. And I thought, what are you looking at me like that for? I've just been through all this. And I kept thinking, I need to ask him something. I need to find out if something about them. If he can give me the answer, I will know what they are. I will know where they come from. Mm. And I said to him, how the hell am I able to get through locked and bolted doors? And his face turned to surprise. If you can imagine animated plastic moving, <laughs> I, I called him Noddy. He didn't look like Noddy, but the way that he moved was so horrible. And I then found myself crashing through, going through really fast, the conservatory glass doors, the kitchen glass doors, and then through to the bedroom and bang, I was up. 
I had a nosebleed instantly. I got up and I had to go to the loo and I felt uh, very violated. Now, the next day, I kept suffering nosebleeds, severe nosebleeds, and I had a mark on the back of my right ear that was in the shape of a perfect triangle. And my brother tried to take a Polaroid. Do you remember the old Polaroid oh, camera? Yeah. yeah. And, and it wouldn't come out. And I got three marks on my arm. And I, needless to say, I couldn't walk very well. And someone said to me, why don't you go to the doctors? And I thought, yeah, I'll go to the doctors. And sorry, I've got to say this. Yeah, I've been probed by aliens. Like, they're going to take me seriously. There was no one you could really talk to. Yeah. But and not only by an alien, an alien in a pointy hat and mm-hmm. another one with a helmet on. You know, like people have said this to me in the past. Oh, if you get traumatized by it, go see a psychologist. They can't tell anyone. Yeah, they can. <laughs> if you've yeah. got children. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you know, it, it, I suppose that there are people now that are more open to this, but I wouldn't feel comfortable in that kind of situation. Um, yeah. Even though I have talked to therapists before about two of them I knew that it was safe to talk to them because of the kind of people that they were uh, but you're not guaranteed to get any understanding if I went to my GP and I told him all this he would literally think I was a crazy person yeah well there's more to it than that and I realized I wasn't going crazy because at that point Sasha like yourself when you have been violated I couldn't work out years later when people talked about an abduction whether or not why it felt like a dream state and yet you still suffered the physical scarring and the emotional disruption that that we all go through through this type of thing no one can understand that Mm -hmm. so that led me then into the sphere of what we were dealing with like you I don't deal with rubbish I deal with black and white and if we have to go forward into uncomfortable territory then so be it But I did start to, many years later, I had problems with my right ear. And um, a few years ago, I'd gone to the doctors on several occasions because my right ear felt like there was something in it and it felt waterlogged. And um, and they'd gone in and they'd looked at it. They looked at it and they said, well, there's something that seems to be healing. But they never once sent me to the hospital. Now, on the last occasion I'd gone about my ear, Um, they looked into it and then the nurse brought a doctor down to have a good look so they're looking in my right ear and they're umming and ahhing and I'm thinking well what are they what are they looking at in there you know you start to worry about things like the dreaded c word or anything Mm -hmm. like and said the doctor said with it well it it looks like there's some crystalline sub substance to it and it looks like it's still healing well I didn't understand what they were talking about and I'm kind of like sitting upright and it was only when the doctor had left. They, she left. She didn't say anything more about going to get it analysed or go and get it checked out at the hospital to take a further examination of it. And the nurse who knows that I'm a medium, she doesn't know about my UFO research because, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I, I'm not one of those people. But she turned around and she said, have you been abducted by aliens? And I've got to tell you, Sasha, I walked back to my car far worse than I went into the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> There's a humor with this. So is there something in there? I believe there is. And because at one point I felt it move and I'm not one for sensationalism or, you know, this happened to me. I report facts as they occur. But certainly with the abduction phenomena, there seems to be two parts to this. One part that seems to operate on a physical level of reality. And the other part, when the abduction takes place, seems almost ethereal and dreamlike, almost to the point where um, you, you you're kind of like, put in a situation where they don't want you to see it as a reality they want you to see it as fantasy but unfortunately with my very not unique experience taught me a lot more and from that moment onwards and there have been other things that have happened in my past I wanted to find out what the greys were where they come from why that why they are here and why the cover-up and and it was I was not more I was not interested about the things that happened to me. I was more interested in the truth of the reality. Mm. And at that point onwards, I made it my mission to find out the truth of what we are dealing with. So that that is like yourself, Sasha. I know that you've had, you know, a pretty uh, intense um, experiences with, um, you know, what we call aliens and, and UFOs. 
but when as you know it happens to you it changes you it, it's it, it kind of like you're on a mission now to find out what the hell this thing's about absolutely and this is why I get so agitated with the UFO community because there's so many people trying to sell their ideas when oh. they've not even experienced anything fair enough you know there's a market for that stuff and they are entitled to muse babble to their heart's content but when you're talking to me and you're telling me how it is when I don't even know and I've been through it that is what agitates me and the yeah. other thing is is all of the pollution it is obscuring the actuality and that is what I want to know and this is why I'm like no don't want to talk to you like you know what I've had people that have said things like, oh, I have an implant in my neck and it sets off alarms at the airport. Ha, 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 ha. No, okay. you haven't. And if you had, you'd be freaking out about it. Yeah. You wouldn't be happy. You wouldn't think it was funny. Certainly not triggering alarms when you're going through the airport. What kind of, right. you, you know, and, and that's that's what I can't cope with. That's. I, I, I think, Sasha, also, the thing, someone said to me, are you going to get it checked? And I said to them, actually, I don't care. I've got nothing to prove. No. If it's in me, then it's in me for a reason. Has it helped with the psychic stuff? I couldn't tell you. Mm -hmm. But I feel as though, you know, I, I've tried to look at the parallels with, with certain individuals with regards to abductions. You get some people who claim they're abducted every day of the week, which I think are really give me a break. Yeah. I, I also understand that I may have had another episode, but I can't prove that because I only recall a very small part of it, and that was it. UFOs, my twin brother and I, have seen most of our lives. The last one was on the 9th of April 2016, which Jason Gleaves analysed the footage which my niece took. Um, and that is something else I'm very proud about because we actually got some form of physical documentation with regards to that. But I understand there are people out there who will make you believe anything. And this is the really sad thing about it. What we are looking for is evidence. What we're looking for is truth. And the only way that we're able to apply that is through some form of theoretical application because I wanted to find out what these greys were. And the more I did the research, yeah, we're still researching. We don't have any answers. None of us know what we're dealing with. But it's important to have some form of theoretical model to work towards and studying other case studies with regards to genuine people who have experienced this and then trying to put the pieces together. Absolutely. And it was in some years later in 1996 and I never would have believed it but I had my first and what I consider to be my only download and for your good listeners out there a download is seems to be some type of information that is distributed to you that you couldn't possibly have known about it's almost like an enlightening moment where there's a flash of realization and parts to an intricate piece to part to a puzzle comes together and this is exactly what happened with me with regards to the greys because from the moment that i had my abduction in 1989 and from the limited um connections because there wasn't really any internet or you know connections that we have today I struggled and worked to try and find out what they were. And then this flash of inspiration came and I thought, my goodness, may I? I think I may have a, a very small piece to the puzzle. So I typed this all up in, a, in an article, sent it to um, a UFO magazine. I can't remember the name of it now. It was quite hot back then. Um, UF oh, I can't remember, Sasha, what it was called. My brain's gone on. <laughs> they covered it. And they called it revolutionary within its speculation, and it was just speculation. Did the greys give it to me? I couldn't tell you. All I knew is that the pieces seemed to fit together with regards to one aspect of this phenomenon. And I know that when you go in, when you were invited on television, which when I was younger seemed like, wow, there was no one to tell you about how TV worked or how the media worked. I was quite naive by the experience, but. It was only after several programs I'd been on that I realized that I was being used as a, a laugh and um, truly suffered with one particular program that was live. And I was with Nick Pope and Georgina Bruni. Malcolm Robinson was there and uh, Omar Fowler. He was lovely. And they, we all knew that we'd been set up because they'd seen us on some other programs. They thought, oh, you're a good speaker. You come on board. And they, the other programs were very nice, you know, discussions. Um, but this was just a circus. And they called the program X-Files or X-Fools. 
and I felt broken. I felt oh. dejected. Felt really um, because the way that they'd um, taken the program was to focus upon my experience. They called probing, and that's what they did. And I realised afterwards, okay, so the system that controls the television networks has got this program in place to discredit the subject and individuals to take away the emphasis of the reality of the uh, the experience and make it a laughing stop. So at that point, again, I thought, you know what, sod you, I'm going to try and find out the answers myself. And thankfully now, you know, we're with a group of wonderful people, yourself included, Sasha, who are after the truth and nothing but the truth. So, I mean, you know, theoretically, I've created a model, but it is just a model. And I know that most people won't like it. But we have to look at all aspects of this because when you're dealing with the greys and the UFO experience, are we dealing with something on a physical nuts and bolts level? I believe that we do. But then they also can, you know, transgress all of that to a non-physical experience. And this is this is what really got me involved with the research with regards to what we call the greys. Yeah, oh, it's all very very fascinating um the downloads that you mentioned yes. i had one um i've had one myself in fact i think i've had two but i really really remember one um when i was just laying in bed like meditating basically and then i and i saw this it was almost like looking at a tv screen it was when i you know trying to visualize things it's a bit uh -huh. sketchy it's you know, you have to super concentrate to do it uh, and practice, but this was just like this really clear blue sky with a bright yellow, big, beautiful sunflower. And I was stunned at how clear and perfect it was. Then it changed to um, a, like a wiring diagram and then what looked like a map. And then this rotating sphere that was made of, it looked like honeycomb and there was like data streams going down the side of it and this was a black with the oh. uh, the sphere was like orange typeset you know but it wasn't the data was orange typeset but the the sphere was the same orange so it's orange on black and then all this other stuff and it got faster and faster and faster and I thought I can't see it all it's too fast and then I thought it doesn't matter it just has to be in there so I just yeah. laid still and let it happen <laughs> and I've no idea <laughs> of anything, but it was a real like it was like really, really, really fast images of different things that I barely got a glimpse of. It was crazy. I, yeah, I think to be honest with you, Sasha, that when you have one of these experiences or multiple experiences, I wanted to find out, you know, your yourself as well. You understand that when you have these experiences, you go through some type of not a breakdown, but some type of uh, trauma within your life. But one of the things that I had a big hang up about was the fact that, um, you know, that we were born, that we lived, that we died. And that was the end, that we were afforded a small glimpse of reality and then complete nullification of consciousness. That scared the crap out of me. Sorry, got to use that word. But, I have, you, <laughs> but I have to tell you that the, the UFO phenomena that we have kind of like boxed into very small, um, you know, areas. It's, it's almost like saying, well, you know, this is this and life after death is that, soul survival. But what I was doing was that I believe that I was trying to put the parts together yeah. because it doesn't make any sense. To, it never made any sense to me that we lived and we died. Yeah. And, that, and then that was it. There had to be more. And that, that realization happened when I'd been younger, when my a grandfather of mine uh, on my stepfather's side had passed over. No one spoke about death. And, and I, I think, not jumping here, but with regards to the greys, what we've understood about them is that they cannot reproduce, and yet we are a species that does reproduce, and that the greys are interested within our reproduction, or what they call hybridization. And that was something that really interested me because I'm thinking, well, you know, most people put them in the bracket of alien. Well, of course, they would be alien. But let's let's just imagine for a moment if the you know, the way that they appear to us is an alien. But really, in fact, there's something quite different. Um, and with regards to the soul, 
because the greys appear rather prosaic. They don't seem to have any personality. They're almost robotic in nature. And there is the argument of whether or not we are dealing with androids or, or we are dealing with some form of cloned entity. Now, my understanding is that if you had some kind of robotic mechanism, the idea of the soul uh, would be, or, and also reproduction, would be too complex for the uh, mechanism to deal with. Mm -hmm. If you had something that was perhaps a clone, uh, you know, a cloned entity, then it would kind of like, it made more sense to me. And of course, my research was trying, to, is still trying to work out whether or not they are clones, whether or not they are demons, whether or not they are robots, whether or not they are us from the future. And I've swayed more to the fact of clone because the theoretical application that I created, the model, suggests of the dangers of us as a species if we begin to clone ourselves. I'm not talking about organs, mm -hmm. but I'm talking about a whole human being. And I think that perhaps the greys had or have paid the price through the process of cloning that they are now trying to harvest new DNA to recreate themselves or at least try to bring themselves back to source to what they have been before they became clones. Mm -hmm. And of course, when you're dealing with this subject matter, you will have all sorts of people, you know, banging on your door saying you're wrong. It can't be this. But let's just be patient for a moment and look at all aspects, which I also have looked into. And I am not suggesting that it is this or that. We have to be open minded by the whole phenomenon. So the Greys seem to work on a program. And to my mind, it doesn't seem like it's good because their intent to keep their modus operandi top secret. And of course, we have the, the military establishments that also want to keep this top secret. So are they protecting the public from a terrible secret or are they just wanting to keep it secret because they don't want us to know about it? We don't know. But the understanding of the Greys is that they are very clever. They know they know how to, you, um, you know, infiltrate physical matter. They know how to connect with us consciously. They know how the human mind works. But in terms of personality, memories, experiences, age, taste, color, the things that make us what we are as human beings, pr productive human beings, is something the greys have lost. And I believe that they want that. They want to be a part of us, but not go through the cycle of death as we do, as it were. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and... and you know, I know people say, well, the greys work with the reptilians and the greys work with the mantis and they're this, that and the other. But as I said, we have to look at it um, from a real technical point of view. You know, forget the reptilians for the moment or the mantis or whatever, because the greys seem to be the main ones that have given us more clues than any other entity that we've examined within the UFO arena. So that's why I've, I've kind of like tried to study them. So they are interested in us as a reproductive species and it was the reproductive cycle and the hybridization program that really got me thinking and i thought well why would an organism that can't reproduce suddenly want to create a new species and I, it got me thinking and of course in the download that i had seemed to re reveal more with regards to a possible connection with that um puzzle now with humans, Sasha, we have different types of humans. We have different races. We also are under the belief that when we die, we have a soul. I'm not going to get into the religious ideology, ideology here, <laughs> leave it out, but we have a soul and that we, when we die, the soul returns back to source. I think that's been proven. Yeah. Uh, but if we cloned you, Sasha, a hundred, a thousand times, you yourself as the genuine copy that have come through the correct birthing channel and carry the memories from perhaps past lives and the present to future lives, you are a natural process of creation. So when you physically die, your consciousness will be propelled back to source. Okay, so your copies, the clones, the physical clones, may only have a spark of what you, you, you were. And they will only have the memory of one life experience because they would have only evolved in one single unit of time. And therefore, when they die, my 
understanding is that the spark of consciousness is not strong enough to be propelled back to where you've gone, but maybe this consciousness has amalgamated itself to all these other clone souls that have found a world that can reproduce. And thus, the reproductive program that the Greys are working on is a project to try to perhaps slingshot their soul into a, or gestate into an organism that um, has come through the correct channel of reproduction. Now, there are different theories. I met Dr. David Jacobs, who, t who um, in Arizona, who told me that his research is very much on the idea that the, the greys are creating a new hybrid uh, organism to take over the planet. Now, I don't dispute that. I believe that there are, are aliens among us. I know people will say, well, I think Philip's lost the plot, but I believe that. But there has to be more to this than what we've been told. And I believe that it has everything to do with harvesting DNA, the soul, the human soul. And remember also, as a cloned unit, the greys aren't a danger to themselves because they're able to link with one mind. With humans, we are very unpredictable. We are very dangerous because no one knows what the other person is thinking. And the system in which we serve is creating or trying a one mind hive consciousness with us as humans through, you know, computers, through technology, getting rid of empathy and the emotions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as I say, it's a very multi complex uh, um, subject and, you know, trying to put the pieces together. But it is fascinating with regards to the grades and also the only the theoretical application that we can work on. Um, you know, with regards to the abduction itself, which is very suspect. Um, and I know we have arguments from people saying it's the government doing this and making out. Well, what a waste of time that would be. Um, you know, you <laughs> wouldn't you agree, Sasha? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's so many things that you said there, but I've scribbled loads of notes because um, there's, you know, as far as their, their physical abilities i mean they are very strong um yeah. they're very small they're very light but they are actually affected by light and i think that's you know when we hear people talking about greys wearing all black some like black leotards that maybe come to the knees up like a roll neck and then they've got the helmet on now i've heard that from a few people Personally, I've seen one in a silver suit and a silver helmet, and it was a tall grey. And I woke up in my bed, and I, I, my bed was opposite the bedroom door, and I always had the hall light on because the house was haunted. I just didn't want to be asleep in the dark, basically. Yeah. So I like, um, I, I wake up because I've got this terrible buzzing in my head, and it's like somebody's put a you know a dentist drill basically in my brain um, and oh. I woke up and I was I felt you know sort of drugged I guess yeah. my yes. my my um, motor skills were limited mm. I could speak and I could lift my head up but mm. I was trying to sit up and all I, and trying to pull myself up on the quilt but all I could do is like move my hands a bit so I was trying to pull myself up on the quilt but I just ended up with a handful of the duvet cover and not the actual there was nothing for me to kind of like grip and pull up but mm. um, as I as I'm looking at the doorway I think I'm seeing a power ranger and then I thought <laughs> ridiculous it's a biker and I thought no and I realised what it was it was like it was all black at first because of the you know the light adjusting the yeah. light was behind it there was literally there was a light bulb right behind it and mm -hmm. then I, I kind of realized what it was and started panicking and I'm like saying no no go you know like go away leave me alone go away and uh, trying to sit up and trying to move and trying to do everything at once you know like you do when you're panicking yeah. um, and it, it was like face on at first and then it sort of turned to the side and it was looking down the stairs. And as I'm looking at it and as I'm trying to get up, my whole bedroom is like the walls and the and the quilt cover 
a change in patterns like I remember pink and white stripes going across but whatever ah. was on the walls it was on the bed cover as well yeah. then it, I, I remember uh, black and white almost like zebra stripe and I knew exactly what that was because I'd painted it uh, in the 90s I had a house with the, the uh, fireplace um, you know the, the chimney I painted it all like a zebra just black, black and white really dramatic and yeah. um, it was that pattern that went across the room and, and I kind of think back and I thought I wonder because the pink and white stripe was wallpaper that I had in the bedroom once so I don't remember the rest of it but I've actually thought since I wonder if it was like all of the bedrooms that I'd ever been in you know the decor yeah um, so I, I, I'm looking at it and it's side on and, and, and all this is flashing around the room you know all these different patterns and I'm thinking he's got a silver suit on and a helmet you know like yeah that's ridiculous yes no one's gonna believe this how stupid yeah. and it just that's turned what want. that's what they want and I'll tell you something as well <coughs> interesting yeah. is that you know we've been led to believe that they are physical in nature I'm not doubting that mm. um, but one of the interesting things is that I spoke to researcher Earl Gray um, Earl Gray Anderson and also Paul Sinclair and uh, we've been talking about this light now that many people see this light and the light sometimes changes and we believe that the greys utilize this light as a way of um, basically creating some type of um, anesthetic mm -hmm. so that the individual can't move they're still consciously aware but they can't move and other people around them are knocked out even if they're light speak they're light sleepers now the greys also will use your mind to screw things up, basically, um, they'll be able to f they'll be able to go through your mind to find things um, that they can utilize to try and make it look like you know you're you're having a bad nightmare, but really actually they're here. Mm -hmm. Now they also are interdimensional in nature because they're able to open portals. That is an incredible feat. But my argument is the fact you said, Sasha, and I, I have heard of of your your experience before with regards to the Power Ranger which is very unique no different from the small motorcyclist that I saw the thin one um, is that uh, as they come in they have to be present around you know if they had this technology where like on Star Trek they could beam you up why not do it but for some reason the greys have to be in very close proximity to you as the individual because they need to make some kind of conscious uh, connection with you. I was you. just going to say that, yeah, it, it felt to me like it was actually inside yeah. my head and that yeah. the buzzing was coming from it and that it was the sheer volume of the energy coming from it that yes. was causing yeah. that, that was my reaction to that frequency. So. And yeah, and also uh, a lot of the times that we've discovered is that when someone has had a UFO stroke alien experience, um, it normally is centered around, um, you know, an individual as yourself who is very psychic, who is, uh, I'm not saying that with nearly, with all of uh, what we call abductees or experiences, but certainly a lot of people not to the point where all they can speak to the dead or do this or do that, but people who are generally quite different from the, you know, a lot of the other folk who just go about their business and they're happy with their lives. But the event when the UFO experience has happened, normally I believe what the greys are doing is that they're ripping open a dimensional portal that can become unstable after a short period of time. So when they move you towards their, their vibrational frequency, or interdimensionally into their domain, um, time, most people can't remember what's happened simply because the brain has been taken out of its normal physical processing of time. Um, the greys don't help either because they know this and they're able to kind of like stuff a load of um, um, images in your head to try and mix the experience up so you won't remember it. But also the, the very uh, careful um, portal they've opened, the very delicate portal they've opened in order to get you into their realm or bring you into their vibrational frequency, that can become unstable. And this might explain why after you have experienced that there is a lot of paranormal activity uh -huh, that's yeah. through the opening itself and become unstable. Yeah. 
Yeah. That, that's one thing that I think we have to take as a possibility. Well, I've actually got something to tell you about that, um, oh, because please. that house that I was in was actually haunted. Oh. <laughs> so, I, and I, did, um, I only lived there three years. It was an absolutely crazy place, and I ended up running away from because we we just were terrified. Uh, but this, so it's the 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 grey in the doorway. It told me why it was wearing the suit. And why it was wearing the helmet. Oh my god. It it was like a bump. It was like a warm bump in my brain. And then I kind of just come, came to understand why it was wearing it. And it's like a dark grey metal material that's soft. And it has these silver threads running through it. Now, I don't know that it is silver, the material itself but that was the colour of it, very fine threads. Now, if you remember, I said to you, the light was behind it. So yeah. I couldn't see this properly because it was all in shadow. When it turned and looked at me, I saw how how long and, you know, the, the, the clear bit of the visor was in the helmet and how long the point was that kind of came to mid-chest, uh -huh. the helmet itself. So how I saw these details I don't know, it was like um, I, I, I could see the material close up, it had a belt as well which I found utterly ridiculous then um, but what the material does is it scatters light, it scatters photons oh. so they, I think that's how they make themselves vanish, disappear, mm -hmm. you know become invisible, but they're not invisible they're there they've just scattered the light around them wow. it also it also stopped any kind of heat any thermal detector so there was no change in temperature it would automatically reflect the temperature of the space that it was in and yes. it protects them from light because we have all these gadgets and they're dangerous to them what I what it gave to me was blu-ray you know the Blu-ray discs that we have in there. Uh, yep. You know Playstations that have the Blu-ray in it. It's blue light, particularly, that damages their internal organs and their internal mechanism. Uh, mm. I, I can't say organs because I don't know that they have organs, but I just know that it was saying, or the information was that it damages them internally. Wow. So the light is important. The helmet was because. The air is toxic, and there are frequencies that are being emitted that actually disrupt their mental patterns and with their hive mind. But also, they have this ability to be able to hear everything that's going on, wherever it's going on around them, and know what's going on around them 360 degrees. Now, for that information, I have to default to my friend Paula, who had an experience with the Greys, who was wearing, she calls him a Danny De, the Danny DeVito alien, because he was kind of like trying to make himself look like a human, and it just ended up looking like a really weird, lumpy, you know, like short <laughs> Danny yeah. DeVito type character, yeah. Yeah. that handed her this jelly stuff. She looked at it, it was a bit like a jellyfish, it felt like a jellyfish. Mm. And he told her to put it to her face, so she did. And as soon as she got it to be a couple of inches away from her face, it came to life and suctioned onto her eyes and around her, her face. Mm. Uh, from that point on, she could hear everything that was going on on all these people that were on it. Like it was like they were. She was in. She said she was in America, or in a scene set up to look like America. And there was all the tall buildings. There were groups of people that were all talking around her. I think that was to demonstrate that she could hear every single conversation, understand everything that was going on with every single person around her, mentally mm -hmm. just knew. And then what? they told her that the eyes and this substance that they put on, this thing that she put on her face, what it does is it filters the light, because we live in black light. Mm -hmm. So blue light damages their internal organs, but black light... I don't know if it damages their eyes or they can't see because everything's too bright. These, this thing that changes the way that their eyes function so that they can see in our 
reality because we live in the dark we're not only not in the dark when the sun shines on us Do yeah you know what i mean so it's all about the light yeah and it's it reminds me when you were we were telling me this incredible information that you know the guy who created those special suits to go under the water to try and deflect the great white sharks or the sharks the, yeah well it is a yeah 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 the kind of chain mail yeah mm -hmm. that is incredible mm -hmm. Wow. But I don't know about the gloves or the shoes or anything like that because I didn't even notice them. Um, I was just caught up in this experience. With, you know, and it's kind of distracting as well because I always found myself, I'm still lying there, but I'm thinking about what is put in my head. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And then I could hear music and it was like modern music and it was like party music and I could hear people talking. There was a conversation. Somebody said, Oh yeah, we're having a baby, and the, another guy goes, "Oh, congratulations, ma'am." You know, like normal conversation. And I've heard that before. Party noise. Other abdu uh, other abductees have heard this party noise, people talking, music. You know, so that, I don't know what that was about, really. But, well, obviously, um, it's, uh, some type of uh, making you all aware that they are able to, you know connect with every thought, everything that's going on around them, which is incredible. Yeah. I think, to be honest with you, with regards to the experiences that you've had, the greys themselves are, are masters at deception. Mm -hmm. They're very, very clever. Yeah. But what's also interesting is that they come in ver a variety of forms. The light is very interesting, as you said, um, and that is really incredible. I certainly will think long and hard now about the you know, what you've told me with regards to the light. And I'm one of these people who starts to mud over things, you know, because I think every single thing, um, an aspect of a person's uh, experience is very important. Well, I'll put you in touch with Paula in that case, because you're better off hearing that information firsthand. Yeah, that would be it. That would be really interesting because, you know, the likes of you and I and, and, and you know, hopefully, and I know that you and I, but hopefully other good and honest researchers are after um, that truth of what they are, but they still elude us. And, and, you know, even to this day that they must have some type of interest within the abductee. And I believe that, and I do agree that they do come on multiple occasions. I don't think it's just a one-off thing. I think mm -hmm. that there is something that goes beyond the physical nuts and bolts. And perhaps we're seeing something that has, you know, connected with our, our ancestors going back into the past. But, you know, what is it? What is what is it that they are looking for? This is this is the big question. What do they want that's still here? Well, oh, they... Paula's had a hysterectomy. She had a hysterectomy a long time ago. So there's no... They still take her. So that, that, that hybridization or that breeding program thing is not the only thing that they have going on. But, you know, I think that through my experiences in my life, and the people that I've spoken to that I know are genuine, they seem to come at stages of development as well. So it's, I think it's um, hormones yeah. have got something to do with it because of the ages that we all seem to have these experiences. You know, those of us that remember the, you know, from being young, um, yes. there yep. seems to be ages that they, they're taken, they forget. Then they remember, say like they'll forget all the teenage stuff. Then they'll remember um, when they're 25 that they've had this thing when they were a kid, you know, and and it all comes tumbling back. There's always some sort of between 25 and 27 where people start having all these memories um, and yes. more experiences. Yes, absolutely. And it's almost as if the greys themselves connect or the UFO phenomena definitely seems to draw to people who think outside the box who are very different um, and, and this is what we're trying to look at in terms well, of I'm wondering if we're different because we've had this phenomena from very young I know yeah. uh, you know a child that was extremely telepathic when they were very young it's kind of grown out of it now but I w and I know that that child was an abductee so they use telepathy, so I think it's almost second nature. It, yeah. I think it is second nature for some abductees because they've been taken from being children and the, the communication is telepathic. Yeah. So telepathy is a natural thing, um, and 
they know what you're thinking and freaking yeah. people out because they're saying what you're thinking you know so that yeah. that's been something that has come up um so i think telepathy as well is part of i think the psychic ability is it yeah. that we're just tuning into people like something that we've done for a long time because that has been triggered in our minds or it's been used whereas we if we don't believe in that kind of thing and families who don't have the phenomena the brains don't work in that way because they've never been made to exactly and you're absolutely right because the phenomenon itself seems to draw to people who are and i I'll quote unquote very respectfully we are different because we seem to be growing outside of the box of of this system that's maddening that controls human thought that controls our emotions that you know do this do that be taught this be taught that and and yet there are those people who are so out of that box and i and i do believe the system that we serve is very much aware of individuals like yourself who probably have files on you and and this true i've heard this from other higher sources it's no ego or anything but i've heard this from other higher sources that investigators researchers experiences are attacked they're kind of like watched and they they you know that they because they they we're bolted we, we're getting outside of the herd that's holding us together and i believe the system must know a little bit more about what's going on but maybe can't control it but they want to know what they know the researchers yeah. know the experience well, they want to know what what we know or what was in our heads through yes. our interactions with them because they want to know about them yes that's who, right. they want to know who they are they want to know what they can do they want to know what they're doing with us they want to know what we know yes absolutely and and it's like you know this whole war on war you've got the military you've got the governments you've got a very few select people and as we know um dare i mention it but there is a lot of uh, darkness in this world at the moment and i do believe that a lot of uh, people um high up people are very much aware of 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 you know professing to worship a darker force mm-hmm. now there has been also the argument of whether or not we are dealing with demonic demonic entities now i i would say no i'm not saying that for every one of them but what i'm saying is that there's a delicate balance between good and bad you have the same with humans you might have it the, the same with the greys kathleen martin and niece of betty and barney hill did, did make me laugh once when she said there's a rogue group of greys and i had this scene in my head of these badass greys going around kicking the crap out of everyone you know <laughs> like the yeah. a team oh, uh, gone bad <laughs> yeah so i believe that um you know with regards to the the abductee it is very difficult for the experiencer to try to come to terms with understanding this but i believe that because we've been equipped through our educational um programs that has you know bled us with this rubbish about this is this and that is that and when these experiences come to you there's a part of your mind that's fighting and rebelling saying well you know th- this is what happened and i believe that after some time um you seem to grow from the experience it's, it's no different from someone who's gone through some real tragic event and and th- later on in life it changes them um you know so so i believe that this change with us through these experiences says the greys or whatever they are are coming in and they can see that certain souls are very different maybe the souls are much brighter um than others and they're interested in in those souls for whatever reason we still don't understand and i go i go back to you know the 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 um process of evolution what makes me laugh and i know you we could argue about this until the cows come home but one simple simple thing is the fact that everyone argues about how we developed as a species coming from homo erectus to homo sapien and you know and they're trying to find this missing link and i can sit back and laugh thinking do you know what they will try it's like the eu really they will try <laughs> everything they can to make something fit when it doesn't yeah one of the main um areas that that does that is not postulated for some very strange reason is the fact that we could have been fashioned and modified by an extraterrestrial species through some gene splicing and i've always believed that we had been probably fashioned from the ape 
that you know these beings saw as the the most prospective suitor and brought part of us from there into this from this planet so uh, because if we had been the uh, the a direct descendants of through natural selection we wouldn't have to shy from our very own sun and certainly we, our bodies will be equipped yeah. with and we would have a secondary eyelid as well to be able to cope with the sun yes that's right but you see they no one it's like the ufo phenomena the abduction phenomena creationalism no one they, these people are like no they're they're like they're narrow tunnel vision sorry they're going down that narrow road i can't see it doesn't exist and yet the phenomena is growing it's becoming more prevalent um with regards to um people around the world getting through these experiences and seeing more and more ufos and I think that we've got an idea of where we are now in a way that we never had before. You know, 30, 40 years ago, uh, you know, like the advent of satellites like Hubble uh, that yeah. could take photographs of the furthest reaches of space and, you know, the the, the kind of vortex, yes. the helical yeah. solar system that we live in, that we were, you know, every time we're being taught about or we see a model of the solar system it's a very placid looking place it's a sun's in the middle all the planets are all on, on these rings that go around and it's all flat and it's all placid but when you actually see what's going on it's like holy hell spin it's like the best roller coaster you know fairground ride that you could ever have you know you, you've got a star hurtling through space that's going forwards and we're all whipping around this thing like you know in this really crazy crazy manner and I, I looked at that and I just thought, what are we? Never mind what are aliens, what the hell are we? <laughs> we live there, that's ridiculous. What is space? There's, you know, when, when uh, the UFO experience in 1997, it was so close, so up front and in your face that it took the lid off my life. So from the top of my head, there's nothing out into those big columns of dust that you see in the pictures from Hubble, right? That my head is connected to that with space <laughs> yeah. Yeah. you know so it makes you feel your actual size which is very very small in the scheme of things so yeah. you know like that just completely changed my perspective on everything and I started to wonder what we were and all these people saying about things that are impossible and if you explained our actual reality our physical actuality as as it is to people 300 years ago they would have thought you were an absolutely insane person because you know if you've been thrown around like that in space then we would know we'd feel it our hair would be flying around all over the place and <laughs> things would be falling off the table all the time you know but uh you know it it would be ludicrous and it is ludicrous when you look at it so i just think well you know ellen musk saying well i think we live in a simulation and in the next breath he says no, there are no aliens. If there were any aliens, I'd know. Uh, so yeah. who does he think's running the simulation then? You know what I mean? Exactly. And you... <laughs> he's thought out, far out of the box. He's put himself <laughs> in another box. You know. It's, no. it's like, you know, space itself. It's <laughs> on space. I mean, you're absolutely correct, Sasha. Um, you know, t totally. You're on my level completely. I mean, when I was a kid, I remembered I grabbed a chair when the teacher said that we lived on a planet, and I thought the Earth was flat and went on forever <laughs> i had this idea now when you go out into space it gets even more scary because i was asking questions when i was a kid very much like you had been yeah. where's the end of the universe where's the end of it and it's like you know well what's first the chicken or the egg mm -hmm. and then you get into the big bang hypothesis but now what we're discovering you're absolutely right going into the quantum of reality we're looking at interdimensional matter and and this is this is something that's very interesting because you know certain research has speculated as to whether or not the UFOs themselves are, can bend or warp space time. I don't know that. But also the interdimensional interdimensional hypothesis is very interesting because that means that we we may be seeing layers to the universe that when we go yeah. through one, we're going into another and another, and it goes on forever. It'd be but like we don't tune in through an old TV dial or an old radio where you used to have to tune through the layers of the frequency you yeah. know and I think I think everything in life is probably like that <laughs> from the micro to the macro layers you know well that would, that would if I went too deep into that I would definitely end up in a psychiatric ward 
uh, I wouldn't know where to start with all of that. Yeah. At least we have the general uh, idea that the fact is that we are being visited by intelligences that are not from this world, whether or not they are from another planet or they are from another lower dimensional frequency or a higher frequency, we're not sure. But one of the things that we are absolutely certain about, taking away all the disinformation, the lies and the fakery, is that, you know, we are dealing with a real phenomenon. And you're absolutely right, Sasha, you're correct. We have come in leaps and bounds now through our kind of like more of an understanding of what we're dealing with, because before it was very much the nuts and bolts aspect, you know. Now we're starting to, or the greys have given signs that, um, you know, some of them come on a physical level and some of them come on a non-physical level. And, and, you know, some of them send this light in, and, you know, the light, as you've quite correctly stated, is very important to researchers at the moment because that's an area they're looking into because light um, carries information. Well, uh, I've got something else to tell you about the light. Go, shoot. Well, love- now, I had an experience in 2007 with the reptilians in se- at the end of September, actually. We've just gone past the anniversary of it. Uh, and on the 4th of October... I had another experience, so that's tomorrow. (laughs) Right. And what it was was I woke up and I noticed that I had my legs and my arms in the air and I laughed at myself because I thought I was acting out some crazy kind of dream, you know. And I I was like, oh, you're doing, you idiot, you know. (laughs) So I, I, I kind of was, you know, the automatic thing to put your arms and legs down, but I couldn't feel my body at all. And then I noticed that, like you were saying before, you know, the grey mist, the st- yeah. it's all kind of steamy, you can't quite see anything, it's very, mm-hmm. very dark, you just getting a vague outline, it's like shadows of light, not shadows mm-hmm. of dark, it's like something's reflecting off something, just a little bit, so it's like this tall, weird looking figure in between my feet, so I said, put the light on, thinking, if they put the light on, I'll be able to move. I'll snap out of this funk that I've got myself in. It didn't occur to me that there shouldn't have been anybody in my bedroom, and it didn't occur to me that there's an orange light outside my bedroom. Where's that gone, or any of that stuff? And I just kept saying, put the light on, put the light on, and then my head sort of flopped to the right, and I noticed that I had a green dot of light in the crook of my elbow, and then my eyes, I always remember my eyes closing and that's the end of it. So that was 4th of October 2007. Then in August 2011, I went to Leeds uh, Exopolitics Conference and um, this woman called Sonia was speaking. Now, I've been talking to her for years and I went to meet her and I've got her to the university etc and I'm listening to her talk and you know we talked on the phone and she'd said this stuff before and we were all like you know just chatting about what it's like and all your fears all the silly little things we talked a lot about that and just got to know each other so what she'd said about the lasers didn't really hit home until I'm seeing this drawing in front of me where she's saying that she's on this uh, table or bed and she's got her legs in the air and there's green lasers all over the place and I was like oh I've seen green lasers so that day I went home and I got on the internet and I'm thinking right green light green light green light what would it be like medical okay green light medical use that's what I typed in into a google search it came up in the previous May in 2011, they'd used, they'd approved green light therapy for pelvic health in women and prostate health in men. Oh my and I was God. like, boom, that wow. is what the probe is. Wow. Green light, it resets something. It, and, the, and the pelvic health, I've got my legs in the air, she's got her legs in the air, there's green light, pelvic health in women. It was just like, do, 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 do whoa okay I've understood something about what they're doing it's not whatever they're doing I don't know I'm not saying that I'm part of any projects with babies or anything like that I have literally zero recollection it's just uh-huh. this one instance 
and it was the green light and um wow so i was like right my brain went absolutely blah, 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 blah. so <laughs> i can't it probably took me two hours to explain what i understood uh yeah. so we'll do that another time but you know, yeah I, they I, I, use light yeah is, is uh for healing or uh, for cleansing or for making sure the frequencies of things don't change or do change if the frequency is off say like in the sperm so it resets the cells frequencies it's so it's you know all uh, is healthy and then um say the ovum are healthy or whatever you know we we have lots of toxins we're exposed to lots of toxins in the air just walking around we spray them around our living room we put them in our washing machine you know so mm. i wonder because we absorb these things through our skin wow well that certainly is something that i you know good lord sasha i mean blimey. <laughs> told you i'd be down to talk to you <laughs> okay, yeah blimey i never do you know i never thought about that but i i really under i think you're absolutely correct i think you know as a species we are uh, not helping ourselves and certainly uh, we may be in danger of destroying ourselves and there is also the question of whether or not the greys are salvaging what they can before you know i'm not i'm not a doomsday person but <laughs> any number of things could happen but also um something interesting you just um reminded me of something when i was coming back from arizona from the ufo conference over there some years ago now um you know i remembered i was on the plane and you know sometimes do you ever get those experiences where you look at something it could be anything that you think is random and all of a sudden it seems to strike a chord or a memory of something else do you ever get that Absolutely. sometimes yeah. yeah so I, I i get that quite a lot and sometimes the imagery that you get beyond the of what beyond what you're looking at seems to remind you of something or that something personal it's not just you know oh it's a figment of my imagination there's a deep core part that pulls you towards it now i saw the greys and when I was on the plane, I didn't see the greys there, but I saw the greys within the triggering of the memory of seeing the top part of where the luggage compartment goes in. Mm. And I had this impression that the greys are very, very, very old. And there is also the other suggestion that we have to look at. Are they our creators? Were they, you know, guardians of us uh, that are still, you know, looking out for us? Now, most people will reject a lot of the um, hypotheses that are brought to the table but I understand that you know in the new book that I'm working on I'm trying to take each aspect and angle that may fit in with a particular person's belief systems because I think it's important to look at the whole as opposed to a part mm -hmm. there are there are the theories they could be our creators there is a theory that they are just out for themselves which I think more I'm inclined to believe there, there's suggestion that they're trying to salvage what they can before things go, you know, all up in the air. Um, or they could be demons. The other thing is that, you know, we have a lot of these people, I'm not getting involved in religion here, but, you know, of the demonology aspect of uh, a lot of the elite people in the world are using bad energy to bring in, you know, these spectres. And we've hear, heard this all about the jinn. Now, I'm not denouncing. I do believe that there are dark elements out there. However, I believe that the greys themselves are far more advanced. They, they don't seem to be connected through my understanding of the world of demonology. Um, that is not to say that, you know, that they, you know, we're all, we're all connected as a species on a soul level. I see, There's, I see it as a spectrum. There's a spectrum yeah. of phenomena. They're at one end and the, and the other stuff's at the other end. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that goes in with the frequency thing and the layers of it and it's different energies. And I do feel that some of these things have actually been created by us because whether we know it or not or accept it or not, we kick off a lot of energy. It's thought energy, it's, you know, our physical energy, it's our emotional energy. And if you are like a powerhouse or you are repressing something and this is spiking out of you, then these things that can be manifest into something else that is becomes like not necessarily conscious but yeah. a brute of your emotions and then that you can actually yeah. haunt yourself and then when you die they don't die mm, yeah that is a very strong possibility Sasha I mean if you you think about it I mean as, as human beings my idea is that 
the soul or the the energy source that the, you know that, that we are in this life we operate on a very limited flow of conscious awareness and what's happening is that everything is being recorded within this life we're just a tape recorder basically mm-hmm. and we die that my my understanding is that that information is sent back to the pool of creation and that we continue onwards on whatever you know whatever well, highest yeah but i think that our thought energy is something else entirely so oh. you know we 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 leave a, a, like a ghost file of our meat machine when we pop our clocks. But I love our <laughs> meat machine, I love it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, that's what we are. So we leave this kind of imprint of the energy of the the meat machine, but that our conscious energy is a part of a collective. Yes. So you know your thoughts. Uh, whether you know they be on a lower frequency, thinking negative things, or completely high-end positivity, you know that is part of what is next. So, for example, Buddhists have their own uh, collective consciousness of what they think is going to happen and will happen when they die. Christianity, you know, you yeah. can live forever um, in the kingdom yeah. of God, and then you know, like you know what I mean in, in all religions. So, yeah, it reminds me of that film, the uh, f- um, the Forbidden Planet, with Robbie the robot, and where the uh, Doctor was creating his own demons. Do you remember that? Where at the end, that it was the, it was him himself who had been creating this de- demon, this monster. Um, that was terrorizing the place and destroying everything. So, you know, that that's kind of interesting. Right. Uh, what, I don't recall that, actually. No. Plan. It's an old film, 1950s film, but um, I like Robbie the Robot. He was kind of a cool robot, but the story <laughs> itself was really very cool. But, you know, in terms... The other thing that I found of interest, Sasha, with regards to the UFO phenomenon is that it is sporadic and it, it happens entirely in its own time. Yeah. As a, point medium when i when those on the other side i mean i always say to people i couldn't raise the skin of rice pudding because the way that the other side relay information consciously is is like downloading a signal into the tv set your hardware basically from the software yeah. but i sometimes see lights and uh, i've spoken doctor I, to dr Irina scott about these lights around people now the energy that i pick up around my the cl- my clients or the people i read for is very different from the UFO phenomena. The UFO phenomena on the varied occasions that I've seen them seems to operate on a more powerful, more overpowering energy um, f- field frequency. And I will tell you that in on the 9th of April 2016, when we'd seen those three huge lights that were hovering over our house when I'd come back, and my niece had filmed them in Marston, was trying to get hold of me. The story's out, uh, you know, what happened. But... It was as though time had stopped. There was no one walking their dog. There was no one coming back from the pub. It was about quarter past nine, a uh, quarter past eleven at night. Sorry, no one coming back from the pub. No one walking their dog. There was no one. Just me and my brother. And I'm telling you, it's correct. It's like the Oz factor. It's like they created this bubble, um, rather like a medium, I suppose, when they start to connect with the client, and then the information comes through constantly from the departed loved one. But there is a difference because when people say, oh, you're dealing with demons, no, we're not. There are there are two different aspects here. One is the psychic that can be operated to bring people through from the other side. And I've not once ever brought a grey through from the other side, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Because people say, have you, have you, have you, I, I had a, I had a conversation with some people in America. Thankfully, the last, never again. I mean, they had it all worked out. You know, she conducted every day of the week. And she dealt with love and light, and it was all lovely. And the the gentleman was telling me, you know, how wrong I was, and that he kept speaking and speaking about all his theories, got it all worked out. And I thought, you know what? I can't deal with this. I can't. There's no room for intellectual debate. There's all worked out. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the problem that we have now, Sasha, on our planet. Okay, we have our very different experiences, but there is a key denominator, uh, a pattern. To most of these and you can tell you can tell Sasha when you're dealing with someone who is genuine mm. you know I can well. more <laughs> more times than not but you know, you know yeah. at the, end of the day at the end of the day our humility and our empathy sometimes can get in the way of that you can't blame yourself yeah. for that what I'm saying is that a lot of people know roughly those people 
who are telling the truth and those who are not. But it's these people that like go off on a tangent. Oh, I was abducted last week or, you know, day in and day out. And it's all love and light. And I'm thinking, well, that's not quite what I'm getting from this because a lot of the experiences are quite terrifying. I'm not saying that's all of them, but the greys themselves do scare people because when you, when you, if you've seen one, which you have and I have, it's not like, oh, I'm scared. It's, it's a deep, deep feeling of dread it's like oh my god what the hell is this it's and there is full of some... terror and shock like yeah. you can't it's it's literally stunning it stuns yeah. you overwhelms yeah. everything and 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 you know and, and if you it's like going back into my past there are even parts that i remember that i haven't written about and they're kind of like remind me of key points to things that have turned up can I tell you of a vision that I had about the UFOs? Oh, please do. Well, I'm still trying to work it out, and I, you know, I'm, I can't. But I had these two dreams, and and I've had them twice, one after the other. I can't remember how long how long apart they were, but they were the same. And basically, I'm standing by this window, and I'm looking out, and it's dark. And then I suddenly see this UFO, and I'm saying to myself, "My God, again, they're real." They're real. I'm so excited, Sasha. I'm amazed. I'm like putting my arms up, thinking they're here, everyone. They're here. Those debunkers, those those people that don't believe they're here. And then as the UFO comes closer to me, it gets smaller. And I'm thinking I can hold this thing. I can hold it. And then it turns into a piece of old rusting lead. The second one, again, was the same thing that happened again, exactly the same. But it turned into an old bottle. And my mind is trying to think, you know, dear God, we're all racing for the holy grail of what this all means. Does this mean that this, that we will never get what this subject matter is? Because, you know, it's staring us right in the face and we can't work it out. So that that's something that I feel wasn't just a dream, as people say, oh, you've just had a dream. Or I believe there was something like you as well. You had that vision of the sunflower and all of the information coming in with that. I believe that there's some type of um, download on a on a very deep um, subconscious level where there's a part of your mind saying this is what the truth is. We can't try and bring it out in your language, but we'll try and bring it out in a way that you'll understand. Mm -hmm. So, Sasha, if you can break that for me, if you can you can you can sort that out for me, I'll be I'll be because <laughs> I have no clue. <laughs> That's interesting, because. I don't know why, but when you were talking about that piece of lead, the, it, it brought back a dream that I had that was like, it was water on this, like, it was like a speaker, it, it was emitting sound and frequencies, and the water jumped up in the air, and it started wobbling all over, like, it looked like an amoeba, but it was moving with its arms sort of flicking out and changing shape. And then it kept going up and up and up and up in, in this with the noise. I mean, the freak and the sound of the frequency that was, you know, they do those things with the sand and it makes all the, oh yeah, sound Thanks. makes the sand take shape. Yeah. Well, yeah. this was the sound making the water take shape, and then it hit this pitch and it, it held form in a perfect egg. Wow. And then wow. I was like thinking, this is a se seventh frequency. That's what I had in my head. Yeah, so, yeah, and it, you're right. You're absolutely right. It's to do with frequency. And this is the thing. This is the really... Sorry, not uh, the seventh frequency. It was the seventh harmonic was the words in my head. Yeah, and it's the harmonic <laughs> frequencies of the yeah. body systems. Now, this is where it gets a bit deep, but let's, let's, <laughs> look at the, let's look at the facts. We are not just, and I love that, so, meat, meat machine. <laughs> I'm going to have to use that. But, you know, Sasha Christie's, of course, is meat machines. But there is uh, the genuine belief that we and I know that we have a soul, that we are you and I and many other people are still trying to work that out. We know there is one. And maybe these experiences are trying us to take us out of this reality that we're stuck in to tell us, you know, there's a whole lot more to your life and about the journey that you're 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 going. You're you're moving. Uh, I can't get my words out. There's so much <laughs> to your life. And a long journey ahead. And we're trying to tell you that, you know, you're part of something much bigger and much grander. Yeah. Now, you know, and I believe that, you know, although that we are guilty of 
of labeling this phenomena as uh, quite disturbing. But there again, we can be forgiven because it, to our mind, to us as uh, processing um, beings, we do see it that way. Whether it really is on a larger scale, we don't know. Um, but at the same token, you know, we're battling the question and you hear it again and again in the media circles. You know, yes, there's life after death. Next minute. No, there isn't. Yeah. Oh, there's life out there, but it's too far away. They can't get here. It's like, you know, give it to the public, then slap it in their face again. This whole thing has to change because, you know, th this disclosure movement, I don't know how that's going to work. You know, Christ, you tell the public in the media that there's going to be water shortage. They're all out there buying the water or a fuel shortage. So how they're they going to cope with a phenomena that we, we don't yet fully understand? I and mean, that will send them over the edge, won't it, really, when you think about it? <laughs> well, yeah, because people are so easily influenced into an emotional reaction these days. You just yeah. have to look at the way that politics has developed over social media, you know, of the sort of past 10 years and the levels yeah. of hysteria and fever pitch that the people are getting to over ideas. Yeah, yeah. And and also the when you talked going back, not not, um, you know, jumping around here, but when you said about the harmonic frequencies, that is also a very interesting thing, because I will tell you, um, which you're probably aware of as well, that in order to satisfy my curiosity with regards to these aliens, as we call them, um, we my brother and I and Susan met the fabulous Peter Robbins many years ago. And he's when he came to England and he said, you know, you guys have got to go to Rendlesham for us. You've got to go there. You know, there's a lot of things happening out there. And we said, OK, Peter, we'll do that. So we went out there and we did a lot of experiments out there. And one one time I remembered I heard Karen Carpenter's song calling occupants. <laughs> and I thought, I wonder if we could. So what we did was that we had meditated at home here in, in Bedfordshire and a week before we were going out, I'm sure it was about a week. And the day had arrived. And um, was it June the 8th, 1998? I think we went out there then. And um, we'd send out our intentions consciously for them to appear to us. We weren't going to take any camera equipment or anything at all. We just wanted to be on a personal level to see them. And you get people, Sasha, who say, oh, I don't believe. Well, that's fine. But I hope to God that people understand that I don't deal like you with rubbish. I just deal with black and white. So we'd gone out there on this day and we weren't expecting anything. I'd gone out into the farmer's field where I assumed that most of this had happened. I didn't know where in hell it was. And I used a pair of dousing rods to find an area in the dark um, where where we could sit in a circle to meditate again um, after our initial meditation one week uh, 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 earlier. And so we had to be careful because the farmer's renowned for seeing people in his field he doesn't like. This is just outside the sphere of the forest. So we found I found this spot because the, the dousing rods moved across and I thought, well, if they're moving across, it must be working because it's found some things before. I'll, I'll just rely on that. So we sat in this circle in the dark, a moonlit night uh, on this date. And it was just before quarter to ten where we meditated and we got up. And, you know, we saw this red light that was coming from the farmer's house. And I thought, crap, he's seen us. He's got in a car and he's coming across because half the field was crop and half the field was barren. We were on the barren part. So we started running back and I stopped and thought, hang on just a minute. Hang on. I, I, that's not a car light because it's red and and it like you, <laughs> running away like children as well yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like you know we you, we were like <laughs> well you know anyone would wouldn't they it's not our land so we're <laughs> there watching this red light and it started to come closer towards us and i thought oh my god and that that bit of fear and excitement starts coming in you and then it shot really fast across the field and went through the crop and disappeared to the other end of the field where the crop was, the end of the crop was, and, and that was it. We thought, oh, my God, Susan, our friend Susan, my brother were like, gee, that was amazing. Well, at quarter past ten, and it was quarter past ten, there was a flash of light above the trees that are very tall there. I could point out where, exactly where it was if I went there. I know exactly where it happened. And there was this object, and it appeared, and it was like a pyramid, and it would, the pyramid was glowing like a yellowy gold colour, light colour, 
And underneath that was a gap and a circular appendage that was dish shaped with these blue lights around its bank. And it just remains motionless. It didn't move at all like north, south, east, west. It was motionless, but it started to turn like a clock. So the top part turned one way and the bottom part turned the other. Well, we got it in the binoculars and that was it. I started to bolt towards it. I'll never forget it. I've written about this. And as I ran, I kept shouting back, tell me it's a pyramid, tell me it's glowing, tell me it has a circular undercarriage, because I wanted to confirm that what I was seeing was what Susan and Ronald was seeing. And they panicked because I was shouting. And I I started yeah. to run through the crop that was my jeans, and I got closer and closer to this amazing device, whatever you want to call it. And then when I got underneath it, it I tripped and it went out like a light. I tripped, fell, took in a mouthful of mud and then spat it out. And then I cried because I was so when I was running towards it, I was a half crazed hominid. I, I didn't I could have been from, <laughs> I was like, you know, like a, a guy that's like, oh, oh, oh I'm my, possessed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, literally. I didn't yeah. think didn't think about anything. But when it went out, it just flipped out like someone turning the lights out and then I, I I cried and then I started laughing and Susan and Ronald were we were all quite amazed by what had happened because I knew that no one would believe us now what happened was what happened were Sasha was the next day I come back didn't want anything to eat I was so stunned I contacted UFO magazine I spoke to them and they were very interested I said hey well, it's not you've got to we've got to tell you about this because my mind was racing with like do you guys have got to understand what happened so this guy called Breen Forbes asked me to write and draw everything and send it to him who would pass it to Peter Robbins he didn't know that I'd met Peter Robbins he said he would pass it to him well nothing happened and it's no conspiracy it's just kind of strange a month or so later it could have been a bit more I'm not sure Sasha because I didn't take a record of when I you know how long it was but I phoned the magazine back up and I said oh can I speak to Breen Forbes and they said well we don't have anyone by that name and it's like Hitchcock moment with a knife when it goes hurt, 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 hurt. No one by that name. I said no, and I said, well, I've sent some stuff to you. I said we haven't had any stuff. So you know, now you can open another conspiracy. But how could there be a conspiracy? Who would believe three people out in the middle of nowhere in a field? But we documented and we recorded everything, and that then ex- told me consciously we are able to connect with them on a conscious level. Yeah. And that kind of like thought snapped into me. <laughs> I thought that whatever it was, I couldn't tell you if it was a time machine, if it was a UFO. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, you're just jumping on the bandwagon. We actually went out there, Sasha, and we did our field research. That's where I met Brenda Butler. I got out the car. I didn't know where she was in the world one night, not the same night. And I said, I'd love to meet Brenda Butler. And who do you think we met that night mm-hmm. in, the, in the forest with Pete? I think it was Peter. Pete yeah, and uh, she had a white Alsatian, and I I went back and said, are you looking for the orbs? Because we thought it was the UFO we were seeing. It was just two people in there with a torch and this music. And she said, yes, why? And I said, I to meet Brenda Butler. And she said, my dear, I am Brenda Butler. <laughs> that was the start of that. So I think all of us are connected through delicate synchronicities. And I believe that on some very unique level, that your life, your experiences, Sasha, are unique to you and they are unfolding within themselves for you and personally you, and I, as, as mine are for me. And I think a lot of ufologists are looking for uh, uh, something that can fit all into that one box when actually it may be very multifaceted. Yeah, um, it's, it's more like a pie chart than a box, you know. Correct. In, Maybe you could have a, some sort of graph, but I think, yeah, don't think they're looking at it in the right way anyway. And they seem to be intellectually frightened of entertaining certain thoughts, you know, like, oh, if I think that for a moment, then I might lose my mind forever. Um, <laughs> you know, you can entertain an idea and let it float through your head and out again without any life changes. Uh, so I think people are frightened to have the conversation because it's all been ridiculed so much and still yeah. is. Even like the, um, you know, TTSA lot 
with the, all the Navy coming out, look, all these people oh. doing all these things. Guy from the CIA, the guy from uh, you know Lockheed Martin, the guy from you know the Skunk Works, and they're yeah. all you know together doing this stuff. But they don't want to speculate what no. might be inside these things. You know, like, well, it's a really logical thing to sort of connect that there might be something if well, we don't know what it is we don't know what the technology is we've got all the best stuff in the world so that's definitely not ours yeah. and uh, so whose is it then uh, oh no yeah. we can't talk about that oh no because if we talk about that everyone's going to think we're mad um, yeah well suffered you I and a lot of other people have suffered in silence through the might of the media machine and that is something that I woke up to very very quickly after I'd you know gone through a very negative experience um, you know and, and through television through the major media outlets and it's not something that I would entertain in the future um, at all unless no. it was actually under we were in control of it because some people are just out they're always they, a hit piece and they lie to you they tell you it's serious they're different yeah. they're not gonna be and and they're always doing the same thing and they damage people they yeah, traumatize and, people who are already traumatized yeah and and you know uh, under you know certain conditions you know it takes someone to see one for them to change it's rather like someone god forbid who gets involved in a, uh, an accident that changes their entire life but someone who hasn't had the accident cannot relate to that so i i get that to a degree but i think the system that we serve has been damaging because what it's doing now, it's crushing empathy, it's crushing our emotional connections with one another. It's trying to really force down now on, on certain subjects taboo, that they consider taboo subjects about life after death. And what a world we would live in if we could just try to work together in uniting in truth and in harmony more about what we represent as opposed to the, you know, the meat machine, as you call us, <laughs> I love that. Uh, or, or, you know, the spiritual part as well. And I use the word spiritual very loosely. I mean that in the sense of soul survival or the continuation of consciousness. So on a grander level, I do feel really excited by a lot of what's going on, and especially people like yourself, Sasha, who go out there to look and search for the truth. And, and even though we don't have the answers, I think to a degree on a personal level that we can't explain in words, we have some form of understanding that we can't yet relate to. And I did like the idea that you suggested also, Sasha, about, you know, building up that we leave some parts of ourselves behind. I really understand that. And that's the film you have to watch, The Forbidden Planet, um, and with Dr. Morbius and, uh, and, and what happened there. And that might give you an idea of, of or generalize the idea of what you were talking about but certainly you know i think with regards to a lot of the mysteries on our planet a lot of the uh, stuff that we can't yet understand this this experience seems to play with us it seems to toy with us it seems to know that we're we're looking for it and yet it it's so elusive uh, I, I say that there's an awareness I'm aware of that awareness, and the awareness is aware that I'm aware of it. <laughs> yes, and that's that, that might be said as well, like Stephen King's It. That is exactly what he said, are we dealing with something like that? And I love the way that you put that, Sasha, because the, what you're right, and a lot of people, people have, I've met have said the same thing. Isn't it strange how when you start becoming interested in it, it becomes interested in you? Mm -hmm. and. But it's something that we can't control, unlike um, clairvoyance or the discarnate communication that that happens on an autom automatic response, I suppose, because the, the those on the other side are facilitating their thoughts into our matrix and through to this mechanism. But when it comes to the UFO field, it has it must be separate in some way because it 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 operates on a completely different level of reality that, that I am aware of on a psychic level. And I've spoken to some other very brilliant mediums that I, I, I used to know who said the same thing. That, you know, they've had these experiences, quite frightening experiences with the UFOs, um, and that, but they don't understand what they are or where they come from. But my modus operandi myself has been to try to merge 
the UFO phenomenon with the psychic phenomena because they seem to go hand in claw with one another. Yeah, they do, don't they? There seems to be a connection, and even if we are wrong, and I will admit that, I'm, I'm a person who will, you know, be open to the truth, whatever truth that it, that it comes in, whatever form it comes in, mm-hmm. but the greys are interested in us as a species because they are interested in what makes us tick. They're interested in our reproduction. They're interested in our responses. They're interested in, in colour and empathy and taste and age. These are the attributes that these prosaic life forms don't have. And I've also made a, a correlation, perhaps, that when we came into being, if we go back into creation, where we ourselves prosaic, and we have amalgamated ourselves to a life form where we could ingest and create and, and, and become, you know, into the physical. The greats themselves may be trying to bypass or cheating the process of reincarnation um, because they don't want to go through the many varied levels that we as humans go through. So there is also that um, con- that theory that we have to take into consideration that if we ourselves try to clone and cheat the process of re- um, uh, reproduction and continuous recycling of souls coming in and out in different lives, that we want one single life, that we may pay the price for that. And obviously also with regards to cloning, you know, the question is, if we clone humans... Where does that lead us? Are we then leading ourselves into a down, downward spiral to a devolution as opposed to evolution? So certainly there's a lot that, you know, we've got to consider and take into a, um, in some form of hypothesis. Um, and, you know, it, it's a subject matter that can go on and on and you could bang it. And I sometimes bang my head against a wall. Yeah, I get I frustrated with it sometimes because... Yeah. I, it's just unknowable, isn't it? You know, the yeah. actuality is unknowable to us in this way. So it is literally piecing fragments together. It's like getting a piece of paper and poking a little tiny hole in it and then spying through that hole and you can kind of make out what's going on, but not quite. And that's what it feels like. Yeah. So your experiences, and especially to your listeners as well, I would say to them that, you know, um, you have to be true to yourself. And when you are true to yourself, um, then, you know, you can't go wrong. The abduction experience, I always thought that it was a very physical phenomenon. I always uh, assumed that it was some fantastic, you know, a physical interaction with aliens. But the truth uh, that I found that I went through suggested, well, hang on a minute. If this was an abduction, why did it seem very different to real life? But after the abduction, I've been left with physical marks. Now, we know that healers can heal people without touching them. They can change the molecular structure of their, you know, their body systems, their organs. And the greys themselves are able to penetrate our reality um, by breaking through to the physical and perhaps, you know, taking a part of our spirituality, our soul into their domain so that when we are linked with them, we're on the same level. We intercept, we interconnect on the same level. And that when we're brought back, because, um, you know, whatever they do to the blueprint of the soul that is you will still affect its physical counterpart because it's still attached to it. Mm-hmm. So the, the argument is, my argument is that definitely the greys are interested in us as a, um, a viable and also reproductive species. But they themselves seem like a prosaic form they're like a blank canvas mm. they don't have what we have and i think and feel that the answer is there somewhere i may be wrong but you know generally looking into that i'm trying to piece together the soul issue and also a lot more that it, it, it takes a you know we'll be here for hours trying to sort <laughs> you know you understand and it's like um your experiences and other people's experiences are just as important Although we're trying to put everything together like a puzzle, it still becomes multi-complex because like your experiences, Sasha, are so unique and different to my experiences, yet they're telling the same thing. Mm. So I believe that your unique experiences are unique to your soul level as it does with someone else's and someone else's Mm. and other people's. But I really believe that you and I and many other people are looking for that answer and trying to put these very small pieces to the puzzle together. Will we make it? I don't know. I'm not sure if we will. Mm -hmm. Uh, But certainly, 
you you must be heralded for you know carrying that torch, Sasha, to truth and to honesty and to integrity with regards to a very multi-complex problem that can't be solved, you know, anytime soon. Um, so, yeah, hats off to you, Sasha. You've done a marvellous job in your work and what you're doing. So we're grateful to that. And I remember when we met, because, you know, I was speaking to someone and uh, and I said, oh, you, you don't you don't half look like Sasha Christie. And you said, I am. <laughs> I said, I am. And I thought, oh my God, it's Sasha Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the best reaction I've ever had from anybody. <laughs> Nobody's been that pleased to see me. <laughs> well, it was like Brenda Butler. I, I, you know, I was hoping to meet Brenda Butler. She said, well, I am Brenda Butler. Like, oh my God, it's Brenda Butler. I couldn't believe it. It's like, <laughs> and I'm all over. I could be talking to a, well, who I believe is a complete stranger, and yet is the holy grail of what I'd be looking for. Isn't it terms- weird when that kind of thing happens? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love it, and that's the stuff that just makes you laugh, because well, we've got all that kind of thought-triggering stuff when our environment seems to interact with us and trigger our thoughts, but then you could just be bumbling along one day, and then all of this stuff will unfold in front of me. Just yeah. like, what? Yeah. That is bizarre. But I, there's something I wanted to go back to. I don't know, how long have we got left? Uh 15 minutes okay right you know when you said that you was you were with the greys and the wall opened up yes and then you were stood there and you were looking down at your house yes and you were like i can't do this and yeah and so you were kind of escorted down and then the noddy was cross at the bottom <laughs> yes well it reminded me of an experience that my friend paul had that you see i really have to get you two together she was playing with sand it was like outside her house somebody had made it into a beach and there was loads of kids playing in the sand and she kind of walked out there and I think I'm getting this right there was a a blonde guy who was really good looking and he had this suit on but he was immaculate but too immaculate there were no creases there were no bends in anything he was just totally kind of like perfect and So anyway, he took her hand and they, they ended up flying. And so she's flying and he wants her to let go. He's going, don't look at me. Oh. But she looked at him and he turned into a grey. Oh, my God. Right? And he said, you've got to remember how to do this. Let go of my hand. You've got to remember how to do this. Wow. That is spooky. And I do know that when I went to go and see a medium for the very, and thank God she was a good one, um, she used to work for the FBI in America, cold soul cases. And I'd gone to see her when my maternal grandmother had passed over. And who do you think was the first there from the medium? It was her. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she, the medium said to me, she didn't know me. She was absolutely brilliant, Sasha. She said, she said, UFOs. She said, I see UFOs with you. And she said, I can see Edgar Casey written across your head. She said, are you on page 92 of his book? Well, I nearly fell off the chair. <laughs> and she said to me, she said to me, but she said, the greys. She said, I'm seeing the greys. And she said, would it surprise you to know that you once were one? Now, at that point, I think we're going back to when my grandmother died. I didn't quite understand what she was talking about. And I certainly would never enter the thought of being a grey but she said that and she said she said to me you're working on a theory she said it's going to take a long time but she said I'm going to tell you she said you'll be able to connect a very very small piece to this together with the psychic and I said what do you mean psychic she said you're going to be a medium I said no I don't want to be a medium I don't (laughs) want to be but she was right you know she 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 said um well as you know with the genuine the, uh, the genuine article, and you meet a lot of genuine articles with ufology. So it makes you think about the greys that wanted me to, f- <laughs> I had I got to look at them, and they just buggered off somewhere. But that is spooky. Shall I tell you my version stuff, of that story the guy- then? I'll tell you my version of the story. I went to see a psychic in Leeds called Tress Connor, and she was amazing. She told me everything that she said totally is, is happened. But one day she said to me, reptilians are real you know like I was like what <laughs> I'd not said anything about a UFO and I'd never been abducted by reptilians at that point but anyway she said we were at a party and my husband said to another psychic why do I always see UFOs so the psychic said to him have you ever looked in a mirror <laughs> so 
So I was like, God. what are you what? telling me? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the scene? Yeah, I've got to so, find the scene. like, all right. <laughs> so, like, oh, my God, the only, I could, the only thing that I would ever sort of dare to speculate would be that maybe souls are recycled into all kinds of different beings and not just humans. Um, but that's as far, as far as I'm prepared to go that's with that one. <laughs> That's a great possibility because, you know, we think we're the only um, intelligence in this universe. You said earlier, Sasha, about space and how frightened I think we would be just to know how far that goes, where it goes, what it is. Yeah. But I do believe that we are linked to not just the human species. I think we have evolved in this form through genetic manipulation, through some form of experiment. Were we slaves? I always say that we probably were created as slaves for the extraterrestrials, and not much has changed today, is it? Because we're still slaves. No. <laughs> but believe that you know, on a soul level, we we got to look at this on a much larger scope. I think we're too contained at the moment. I think there's a much bigger picture to all of this, and certainly in one lifetime, it, you know, the, the there's... system seems to be a huge distraction from it, and that's oh, yeah. why it's absolutely laughed at. When oh. those few black sheep go, well, what about this? You know, <laughs> and the things that make you think, what about this? Like DMT or any of those kind of things that literally, I mean, I've never taken it, but I've seen people change massively. Even Mike Tyson, right? Mike Tyson did DMT. He's gone from being, from what, chewing people's ears off uh, to growing cannabis and floating around like a big fairy. You know, like he, literally, I'm not even joking or exaggerating. He's oh. like he has completely changed. His aggression has gone. It's all like boom. That and yep. and that is illegal. We're not allowed to do that because no. you might actually become authentic. You might actually become your authentic yep. self and go, yep. "What the hell are we doing? Yep. Living like this?" Day yeah, David, I was right. We're robots to a system. The system wants us to be robots. And I read his book, Robots Rebellion, many years ago. And I thought, my God, my God, this guy's on the right page here. Yeah. Um, I know, you know, we all have our different thoughts about things. But the way I see it is that we are investigators, UFO investigators, researchers. It is not ego. It's not sensationalism. I have it's felt curiosity. that. curiosity. 100% yeah. curiosity. And they and I had some of my work compromised, which shocked me into the realization that you know what, this stuff is real. There is there is obviously some aspects to certain areas that the the system does not want the public to know about. And you know I'm I'm just a I'm I'm just a very small piece in all of this, and I'm so pleased and honoured to be connected with a lot of good people who are out looking for the same thing. And you know it's interesting to uh, listen to their experiences and share within their experiences that I really um, empathize with because, you know, when you're there, which I had been back in 1989, um, you know, I'd had a few other UFO experiences, quite a number of them. Some of them are so um, strong, they've never left me. That one, the one with our grandmother in the garden with the silver sphere and, you know, the ones that came in 2016 on the 9th of April, they're things that you, you remember like, it was yesterday, and yet there are certain things I can't remember that I said that, that I spoke about yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly, it tells you, uh, as yourself, that when these experiences come in, they are real because they make such an impression upon your psyche. They will never leave that, and there is a reason I believe for that happening, most definitely. Yeah, it's definitely not nothing, and that's what we're told it is. It's oh, like, oh, it's sleep paralysis. Well, oh. what, what, what's what's the mechanism of sleep paralysis? We don't know. Okay, so you're giving me an unexplained thing to explain an unexplained thing. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty then. <laughs> yeah. And you want me to listen to you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but it's been great though. I've really, I've really enjoyed and and grateful to the time that you've given me, Sasha, on your wonderful show. I mean, you know, to a lot of people who come into this new, it's kind of like. Um, you get into the deep waters because their psyche is programmed with what the system has taught mm -hmm. them as truth. Yeah, and when it's something... that we are batshit crazy. <laughs> oh, and I love being crazy because yeah. at the end of the day, we know that we're not. We know yeah. that we're 
suffering and, and <laughs> yeah. my, my last therapist bless her Linda um, her, her last name was Heaven <laughs> she was amazing <laughs> She, I talked to her about it she believed me uh, she was into all that kind of stuff as well she was relieved to have uh, a client. I was doing mindfulness um, and she said to me you know like because I was saying, but I just feel like it's cold. I just feel crazy sometimes. My head is out of control. There's all these thoughts and these ideas, and, and then my brain just wants to have an answer. It's not satisfied. Like I, I can accept certain things, but my brain goes, no, I really want to know. So I'm not going to stop chewing it over. I said it makes me feel crazy. She said to me. There's no cure for sanity. <laughs> That's sanity, you know. Like you have to learn to live in your own skin. I was like, oh my god, where do I go from there? <laughs> I need to be able to hide behind the crazy lady some days because it all gets a bit too much. I go, no, I'm just crazy. I'm mental. And then I think yeah. about well, the, you the can see <laughs> You could see it around the world when, uh, especially at work as well, in other areas that people work in, like people just switch off. Uh, and I can understand, yeah. but you know, we, you, and people like yourself, and many other people, are pioneers into the truth. And thank God for people like you, because without you, that we'd still be going around in circles. And yourself. So, I mean, you're the one trying to put a theory together. <laughs> well, I think, I think there's many uh, parts to that, and hopefully, I mean, I, I, I certainly have never been one for the limelight or sensationalism, but there is a deep need inside my soul for that truth, and I think to to yeah. damn the system that tells us that no we are right and you are wrong and I'd like no actually mate that you are wrong and we are right and um, you know I'd love to to, to get into the core yeah. of that you know I don't know what I'm right about because I can't <laughs> quite put my finger on it but I know <laughs> it's not that <laughs> no, definitely so you know we'll continue with the research with the soul um, with the abduction phenomena, with the theoretical aspects uh, behind that, um, and you know, trying to piece more parts to the puzzle together. I am, I'm working on a book that I've almost finished for Philip Mantle's Flying Disc Press called "You, the Public Deceive the Grand Jury for Deception," which deals a lot with old cases and new cases, then coming into the theoretical aspect of that. But I will be working on another UFO book, which I hope that we'll be able to explore this in much, much finer detail. But that's going to take some time. But I'm, I'm also halfway through a spiritual book called Guardians of the Dead that I hope to get finished late next year because this UFO one has come in before um, while I was writing that one. So I've had to kind of like put the other one on hold for a minute. And what um, books have you got, actually got out there now? There's, uh, there's a few science fiction children's. The, the, the ones that... Um, were published to do with was, was uh, reaching for the divine that was a psychic book then there was uh, believe bridging the gap between the psychic and ufo phenomena um, and sky crash throughout time which i co-authored with brenda butler um, which is a continued investigation to the rendition ufo mystery and then i brought out through amazon because i lost my publishers they both died um a passage to eternity the enigma of the dead ufos and aliens um, so that explored more of the, the soul part and the uh, theoretical application of the abduction phenomena um, uh, in, in more detail. But as I said, we're still putting parts to the theoretical model together and uh, that might take some time. So, you know, it's interesting and I enjoy doing it. I love meeting people. I love listening to their experiences. And, you know, I, I really am grateful to the opportunities that, you know, people like yourself and other people have given me in having a small voice to help towards something that we can bring to the table, basically, all of us. Yeah. You, me, we, are, we are not afraid to have the conversations. And no. We know that other people want to have these conversations. They're just frightened of doing so because of the ridicule factor. you know. And I think that's an area that we've got to do a lot of work on uh, yeah. in the communities. Just, you know, yeah. the snobbery no. is ridiculous. Yeah. To share, work, you know, talk, um, pull the ideas around and that's how I, I think it should work with honesty and integrity and honour and I think that's the only way that we're going to make any uh, headway into this phenomena definitely. Yeah, absolutely and you've got your own radio show as well haven't you? Oh yeah, it's a Twin Souls, I do that with my twin brother Ronald who's the artist and author himself 
and um, we that we do that once a month because um, obviously uh, there's a lot of work in between and you know, doing other stuff as well. So uh, yeah, that that's a great opportunity with the Paranormal UK Radio Network. So we're very honoured for that as well. Uh, we get some very interesting guests on there as well, which is fantastic. Brilliant. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure, and I've got so much more to tell you. But for now, we are okay. over and done. And thank you for being my guest. God bless and thank you very much, Sasha. It's been a real honour, a great honour. Thank you. Thank you, too.